Take your Bibles tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 5. Verse number 5. And uh, pray that we'll be in the will of the Lord tonight preaching. I went to a church one night to preach and uh, go right ahead and stand if you'd like for the reading of God's Word. We won't be too long that out got to the church and and uh, there's about I don't know 12 15 people in this a seat there's everyone on this side there was not a soul on this side of the church and uh, it was on a Sunday night and it just looked like everybody regular was there and, and the Lord gave me a message on salvation and I thought well Lord ain't nobody here is lost ain't nobody looks like it's lost and but I just couldn't get away from it so I just preached what God gave me Never will forget that night that a deacon and his 18-year-old son got saved. I never, and I told him, I said, y'all probably saved, but I'm going to preach this whole side like this lost, okay? And, uh, but God's night give me an evangelistic message. Now, tomorrow night, if you come back, I'm going to auctioneer for you, okay? I promise you come back, I'll auctioneer. I've auctioneered for 40 years, and I'm going to tell you something. I've been in lots of homes, and I know, uh, I, I, uh, I know a little bit about life. I know you do, too. But let me tell you something. There's three reasons you do auctions. Death, debt, and divorce. Yep. And you're dealing with people's toughest issues of life. And uh, I've seen a lot of people weep and cry. I've seen people lose everything they ever worked for all their life. But it's been a ministry. And uh, But it also, I'll tell you something. One of these days, somebody's going to probably walk in your house, and they're going to pull out all the junk, that, 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 all that stuff you wouldn't let the grandkids touch. They're going to throw it out on a table and sell it for junk. All that stuff you think is important tonight, it ain't very important. No, sir. And so anyway, uh, let's go to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5, and then we're going to jump just a little bit there and take off. Now, I'm going to take me just a little bit of time to get my train out of the station, and once we get her out of the station, we're going to roll, so I want you to be ready tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I mean chapter 13, and verse number 5, how many is there say Amen. amen. Here we go. The Bible said, examine yourselves. Now, that's talking to those that were at the church at Corinth. He said, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. God says, listen, uh, I want to say one thing about salvation night, because even last night dealing with people, God doesn't want you wondering whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. That's right. That's right. God is a very clear, yep. decisive. He's not up there taunting, teasing, confusing you. If you're in confusion, it's because of Satan and because of the carnalness and the mind and so forth and the world's junk. But God doesn't want you dying wondering where you're going. He wants you to know whether you're saved right. and he wants you to know whether you're lost. Right. And tonight we're going to preach in a way, hopefully, that the Holy Ghost that before you leave here, you can either know for sure whether you're saved or for sure whether you're lost. God says, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. That's exactly what we're going to do. The Bible said, and while we're standing here for just a minute, that Proverbs 16, 25 says, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. God said, you could, it might seem like you're on the right road. You might think you're headed to heaven and yet not be. The Bible said in Matthew chapter 7, straight is the gate. Narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. Amen. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Yep. And the Bible is very clear that uh, we need to make sure about where we're headed, and I want you to pray with me tonight that God will bless this message and save people. Uh, Lord, we thank you tonight for this time we've had to be together. Thank you, Lord, for all the hospitality, the blessing, the fellowship, uh, the good music, Lord, and just God the desire to see revival. And Lord, tonight I pray right now that I would be hid behind the cross of Calvary. And I mean it, Lord. God, if they don't see you tonight, Lord, it ain't going to be worth a dime. But I pray, God, tonight that you lift up the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And that, folks, the Lord, I pray the Holy Ghost of night that will do the preaching on the inside of their hearts while I preach from the outward. I pray, God, you'll fill me with the Holy Spirit of God right now. Lord, you said if we being evil know how to give good gifts unto our children, how much more shall you give the Spirit to them that ask? And so, Lord, tonight I hear, Lord, as a servant, as a vessel, I pray you that you'd preach through me. I pray that you'll put it on me and put it in me and preach me tonight for the glory of God. And I pray, God, tonight that you will search the depths of people's hearts tonight. 
And Lord, we just pray that folks will get saved here before they leave. I pray, God, tonight that nobody in the sound of my voice will leave here lost without God and go to hell. I pray, God, don't let that happen. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that you bring great conviction and bring the truth to bear in people's hearts and minds. Lord, I'm helpless without you, and I mean that, Lord. I, I, Lord, I don't know if I ever realized, Lord, my incapacity, Lord, my weakness tonight. But, Lord, in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. So, Lord, we pray tonight that you'd move heavily and mightily in this service in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. And I thank you again for being here, and I thank you again for all the hospitality. Years ago, I, I, I'm a college dropout. I used to tell people but several years I, that I was had two years of college until I finally realized that that was just a cop-out way of sounding smart. Truth about it is, I started my third year, I dropped out. And so I'm a college dropout. I've never been to Bible college. Some of you might want to get up and leave. I don't know, never been to seminary. You might want to say, well, I ain't listening to this guy. But uh, anyway, I got saved when I was 28, called to preach. And uh, it's called to preach is a call to study. But when I was in college, the, the Ava High School uh, basketball team went to the state championship. And so a bunch of us guys at SMS, the college there, decided we'd drive up and watch the game. I jumped in. The, it was, looked like a bunch of bullfrogs in a Volkswagen. And we jumped up there and we headed up there and watched the game. And real, real late at night, needing to get back, and we headed out. I jumped in the back seat next to the left-hand side. We're heading, uh, I didn't pay no attention where he's going, and we're heading up there, and all of a sudden, I'm kind of trying to sleep, and I kind of open one eye, and I look out, there's lights going by. You know, it is 12 o'clock at night, and I start seeing signs about Jeff City. And I thought, Wait, Jeff City, where in the world, what is he doing, Jeff City? And then I see these signs of uh, uh, Macon and all these signs up there in North Missouri. And finally, I wake, I kind of woke up, I said, hey, where are you going? He said, I guess I'm going to Ava. I said, well, how are you going to Ava, going to Jeff City? You're heading straight north. You need to be heading south. We said, I thought we was going the right direction. You know what? We'd went about an hour in the wrong direction, midnight at night, needing to get back down to Springfield, Missouri, and he thought he was going the right direction. You ever done that? Yeah. I remember one time we had, our kids was little. We went to tennis, Knoxville, Tennessee, to, to a homeschool conference over there. And, man, we were slap war out. We took off back home. And, I mean, it wasn't five minutes. To, uh, kids was all sleeping back in that old rig, and Karen was asleep. And I'm heading out of Knoxville. Now, I'm watching the signs. I just don't like big cities. Never go along. I, I'll tell you what, I'll sleep all night in the woods, but don't put me in the big city. But anyway, I come out of there, and I'm heading out. They're all asleep, and I'm going down the road, and I'm wanting to get to Nashville. But all of a sudden, I start seeing these signs about an hour later, Chattanooka. <laughs> I start seeing signs about Georgia. I'm like, man, I don't want to go to Georgia. I want to go to Missouri. And I'm heading that way, and I mean, all of a sudden, you know what? I'm, I'm talking about, I was real close down here. And that's the only time, except this time, that I've ever been in Georgia. I had to go around and make a little loop into Georgia uh, to get back to Missouri. But you know what? All the time, I thought I was heading in the right direction. Amen. Let me tell you, a lot of folks think they're going to heaven. The Bible is very clear. Jesus said that in that day, there'll be many say, Lord, did we not... And he lists a list of things they did. And some of it's even casting out devils. And he'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. I want to give you some things tonight that I will be road signs on the road to hell. I want to preach tonight on road signs on the road to hell. You say, Reggie, why do you need to preach that? Because God loves us so much, he does not want you dying deceived. He does not want you dying deceived. Satan is a deceiver. And I promise you something, Satan's an imitator. He has an imitation Christ. He has an imitation gospel. He has imitations by imitation Bibles, and he'll give you a false sense of security tonight. And I'm going to say, I'm going to make a blunt statement. Some of you tonight very likely have been so filled with the statement, once saved, always saved, that you don't even have the slightest clue that you're not saved. Now, I want to tell you tonight, I believe, I don't, I don't use the term once saved, always saved because it is not a Bible term. It is a Bible principle, but it's not a Bible term. The Bible calls it eternal life, Amen. and we need to use Bible terms. Now, I'm going to say this, though, that if you believe just because you got, quote, saved, and there's nothing bothers you and you can just do what you want to, then you don't understand salvation. And we've got abundant people across this country who are saying they're saved and they're hanking on. I mean, the only thing they know is once saved, always saved. And they'll go out and live like the devil and the spirit of God is not at all in their life. And I believe that's deception. 
You say, why does God want you to be sure about your soul? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary and shed his blood. And I want to tell you, in the darkness of those hours, took my sin and took your sin and the sin of the world in his own body on the tree. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If God so loved us and it was so important that he, I've got three sons, I wouldn't give a one of them for all of you. Amen. I don't love you that much. I'm just going to tell you the truth. But God gave his son for our sins and died on the cross and shed his blood and was buried and rose again so that you and I could be saved freely by grace through faith and given eternal life. God knows it's important. God knew we could not save ourselves. God knew that. And we could not have the righteousness required. And so he imputed to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. But let me tell you another reason I believe God being a holy God, and somebody says, hey, Reggie, are people talking about oh, God loves you, God loves you, and America's been filled with that, and God does love you. But I want to tell you something tonight. The greatest attribute of God is not his love. Most churches will do a backflip and run you off for saying that, but it's the truth. The greatest attribute of God is God's holiness. God is holy above his love. You say, Reggie, you prove that to me. I'll be glad to. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. He gave his Son. Is everybody going to, to heaven? Why not? God loves us. Why not? God so loved us he gave his Son. Let me tell you why they're not going to heaven. Because above his love is his holiness. And God will not forfeit one ounce of his holiness to put you in heaven. God is going to protect and reserve his holiness. And you have that's why you've got to come through Christ. Because it's the righteousness of God in Christ that is imputed to you that God accepts. It's not our righteousness. All of our, all of our righteousness, us, plural, put together in the world, is as filthy rags. I milked cows all my life growing up. Milked a lot of it most of the time when I've been grown up. When I was a little boy, I remember one day, we used to have, anybody know what a rag bucket is, milking cows? Anybody, one, two. I tell you, America's gone to hell. Nobody knows what milking cows is anymore. I tell you, you need to buck hay bales, cut sprouts. You need to pick rock and milk cows. You're not an American. Where I, but anyway. That shut it up, amen. Anyway, but I reached down that old rag bucket. Now, we milked about 80 cows. We had wiped them old cows' udders off, and they get nasty. And I'm talking about nasty, nasty. But you clean them udders off, we throw that rag in the bucket, and maybe a three-gallon bucket. And I'm going to tell you, after about 40 cows, that's nasty. It, and one day I reached down to get a rag out of that bucket, and the Holy Ghost of God said, that's your righteousness. That's the best day you've ever had. That's the best preaching you've ever done. That's the best you've ever lived. Your righteousness is as filthy rags, and you'll never get saved till you're done with your righteousness. I don't care if you give the United Way. I don't care if you give the church. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how nice you think you are. Your righteousness is filth in the sight of the Holy God tonight. And God gave his son that you might have his righteousness, and God is protecting his holiness tonight. But let me tell you one reason. He doesn't want you to die and go to hell. Have you ever thought about what it would be to die and go to hell? We live in such a fantasy world and a fake, this whole country is in a fake zone. I mean, there is no reality. And I'll say this again, I know I said the other night, you go to a funeral and they'll pump them flowers up there. They've got, they've got makeup on the body. I'm gonna tell you something, if they didn't have perfume on them and makeup, they'd already be stinking. We put flowers up there and get up and talk about this and talk about that. I want to tell you something. Death is not a reality. Much less death is hell no longer a reality. When's the last time you went to a funeral and a preacher said, far as we know, he went to hell lost without God? Everybody preaches that. I want to tell you something. I want you to think for just a second why Jesus died for you, to keep you out of hell. I'm saying tonight, the second you die, you take, I've seen it. I've been in a hospital. I've watched people die. I've watched them. I've watched, and they'll say, well, how long has he got? Maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden. I'm going to tell you right then, that soul departed from that body, and if they were lost, they busted into hell. And the Bible said, in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment. I want you to think about dying tonight and going to hell. And that's why Jesus Christ died for your sins. And that's why this Bible is full of warnings and warnings and warnings. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
Do not deceive yourself about where you're headed for eternity. I'm going to give you some Bible reasons tonight, and then we're out of here on road signs to hell, warning signs that God gives. Number one is the craving sign. I call it the craving sign. You have no hunger for the Word of God. You have no desire for the Word of God. You'll read religious books. You'll watch every TV evangelist there is. You'll listen to the radio. You'll even listen to Reg Kelly CDs. But you have no hunger for the Word of God. Are you listening to me? People are reading magazines. They're reading their denominational writings. They're reading all this junk. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. Do you really read the Word of God? The Bible said in 1 Peter 2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. In Job chapter 23, the Bible said, he said, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. Jeremiah 15, 16 said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were, thy word was unto me as the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I want to tell you, I was, a real, I was a lost religious man for 28 years. I want to tell you, I wouldn't read my Bible. I had no desire for that Bible. I had no desire for real spirituality. And I'm saying to you tonight, I don't care whether you're here at this church service or not, if you don't have a desire for the word of God and a craving and a hunger for the righteousness of God and the word of God, that may be a sign tonight that you are not really saved. Listen to me tonight. A baby gets born, I'll tell you, you don't have to force feed that little babe. Amen? You give him a nipple and he's gone. Amen? I'll tell you something. You give me a man that's saved and that man will be in church. He'll want to read his Bible. He'll come say, what's that mean? How do you pronounce that word? I'll tell you something. We need people that are saved that read the Bible. You know why our churches are in the shape they're in? Because by and large the people are unsaved and they are not reading their Bibles. They do not have a desire for the Word of God. I'm going to ask you a question tonight. How much Bible did you read today? How much Bible did you read last week? How many Bible chapters are you reading today? I'm not talking about being legalistic. I am telling you when the Spirit of God indwells you and you're saved, He will put a desire for the Word of God in your heart. I'm asking you tonight, how much Bible have you been reading? You, you just be honest tonight and just ask yourself, I'm not talking about some little duty to be self-righteous and say, I read five chapters a day. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about spending time. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seateth in the seat of the, con of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. I'm telling you, listen to me tonight. The old timers in this country didn't sit around watching as the world sins and spins and pukes and vomits and all the garbage and the orphic garbage filth out of hell. I want to tell you something. They read their Bibles. You want to know why this nation was founded like it was founded? Because they read their Bibles. Those people were born again. They love the Bible. They love the Bible. They love the Bible. They love the Bible. Do you have the craving sign? Is there a desire and a hunger? Do you say, man, I need to read the Word of God. Oh, God, I tell you what, I want to read the Bible. Down in your heart and your soul, you want to read your Bible. I'm telling you tonight, if you don't have a desire to read the Word of God, there is something wrong inside your soul. Amen. I'm telling you, I know by experience I'm not up here preaching somebody's little three points in a poem. I'm not up here to try to get hooked in and see how many revival meetings I can get down in Georgia. God put me here tonight, and I tell you what, I've got three, four other messages I wanted to preach, and I could not get off this message, and I don't know who it is here tonight that needs to get off. But if you don't have a desire to read the Word of God, there is something wrong with your salvation pr proclamation. Number two is a carnal sign. A carnal sign. You say, Reggie, I'm talking about loving the world more than you love the Lord. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. James 2.4 says, Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. I'm saying this to you tonight, that if you're more interested in looking like, dressing like, talking like, walking like the world, there's something wrong with you. Let me tell you something tonight. I remember when I was a lost, professing a hypocrite, a good friend of mine had a Bible camp down there, and I was going to work in the youth camp. I had hair down to my shoulders. You know what he told me? He said, you can't work down here, Reggie, unless you get your hair cut right, like a man. And that offended me. Now, I claim to be a Christian, but I'm going to ask you a question. Why did I have my hair down my shoulders? Now, I know that's 25 years ago, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this much. You know what my real problem was? When I was around the worldly crowd, I wanted to fit in there. When I got around the church crowd, I wanted to fit in there. I had a carnal sign. I had a sign that I loved the world. I know you can be saved and be carnal. I know all about 1 Corinthians. I understand that. 
I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm talking about if there is within you a desire to more please the world and conform to the world and be what the world says to be than to be what Jesus said to be and you're not willing to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus Christ, there is something wrong with your salvation. But hey, the third sign tonight is the confused sign. You say, I can't understand the Bible. I'm going to tell you something tonight. Did you? I, was, I, I am so irritated at, at the idea that everybody's got to go to some theologian to find out what the Bible said. I want to tell you something right now. You give me some old plow boy. You give me some old country boy. You give me some old boy. He ain't never been to Bible college, but he loves God, got the Holy Ghost in him. Hey, you know what tonight you need to do is just get you an old dictionary. Don't go, don't go looking at, hey, get off that Greek and Hebrew nonsense. Ain't nobody preaching that in the pulpits of America. Ain't nobody, you preach Greek to your head's blue. Ain't nobody in the world going to get saved by it. I want to tell you something. You'll do well to read the English authorized version Bible. Amen. And another thing tonight, Quit going to the Greek, I'll tell you, get you an 1812 Webster's Dictionary, and if you don't know what the word means, look it up, amen. That's what you do at your college class, isn't it? That's what you do if you're studying science. You go look up what the word is. You don't say it ought to be retranslated, do you? Right. Amen. Let me tell you why I know this country's lost and dying and going to hell. Now, you may not like this tonight, but it's truth. This business about easy to read Bibles, that is nothing but a sign that these people do not have the Spirit of God in them. Amen. I'm going to tell you how you're going to understand this book. It's called The Doctrine of Illumination. It's when you read it and you say like David, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And you say, Oh God, speak to me through your word today. Can I tell you this is about, a, if you take the proper names and, and, and places out of this book, out of this, this old authorized version Bible, it's fourth grade reading. Amen. Let me give you this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he taught them, saying, What's so tough about that? I'm going to tell you what's so tough about blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Is that some kind of hard to understand? The problem is, folks, that when people say, I don't understand the Bible, what they're saying is that they do not have the spirit of God in them because the spirit of God's what's going to make you understand that. By the way, tonight, unless the Holy Ghost of God works inside your spirit while I'm preaching, even my preaching won't do you no good. Unless the spirit of God is working, it takes the spirit of God to illuminate this book. I'm saying tonight the carnal sign, the confused sign, Listen to the Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 says, But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. I'm going to tell you something. You don't need some little 10 cent evangelist like me or pastor. I'm a pastor, actually, what I am. You don't need some 10 cent evangelist from Missouri to understand your Bible. You get in that Bible and compare spiritual things to spiritual things, and God will show you things that blow your mind. I'll tell you, you don't need drugs to blow your mind. Read your Bible, amen. Understand who God, look, I tell you what, you just study God, and pretty soon you'll spin out because he's bigger than you can understand. But I'm saying this tonight. People say, well, that Bible confuses me. I want an easier to read Bible. No, no, no. You get on your face. I'll, let me give you an illustration of this. I was raised, I told you, believing that you can lose your salvation. Now I'm talking about I was raised strong that you can lose your salvation. We believed you people were out of hell. We believed you were teaching a damnable doctrine. You teach it to a person who had eternal life. Why, we believe that's damnable doctrine. You were just sending people to hell. And we believed that. I was taught that. I got saved in 1982, and I'll tell you the problem with me was all I ever done is hear a bunch of denominational preachers preaching the de denominational line. I hadn't read my Bible. So I started reading my Bible. Now I'll tell you what, God put it on my heart. I began reading about 20 chapters a day, about 10 out of the old, 10 out of the new. I'd read 1 Corinthians 13 every day and Hebrews chapter 11 every day. And I'm telling you what, God began, I've been reading from Genesis to the end of the Old Testament, reading from the New Testament through, and all of a sudden I start seeing stuff that I'd read about in the Old Testament. God was mentioning it in the New Testament and I began to put those things together. And you know what I began to read? I found out there's all kinds of verses them old boys never would preach on. They never would preach on, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. They didn't, I mean, they didn't even preach John 3, 16. They're so scared of it. It says everlasting life, don't it? But let me tell you how it happened. I so bullheaded, you couldn't have changed me with a baseball bat. I'd let you kill me before I'd change my mind. But I got to read my Bible. I got to read the stuff. Boy, it wasn't matching my theology. And one night I was reading 1 John chapter 3, and it said, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, for he's born of God. 
And I remember hearing a preacher say one time, well, that verse means that you don't practice any if you're a Christian. That is not what that verse says. I'm telling you something. So I decided I was going to get real spiritual and real theological, and I looked up a Strong's Concordance of what the word cannot means. <laughs> you know what? It helped me a little bit. Because it ain't wrong to look up Greek and Hebrew def definition as long as you don't use that as an authority over the Bible. So you use it the same way you would in a Sears Roebuck catalog. You want to get the full meaning of the word. And that Greek tense on that is this here. Cannot at any time, in any place, under any condition. Well, I shook my head and I said, well, bless God, cannot means cannot. Amen. Amen. Now you listen to me. I was reading that, and I said all of a sudden, well, Lord, now I want to ask y'all something. How many of you since you got saved? Now, I like to do this or Armenian churches. I, I used to preach in all kinds of, I mean, I've preached, I've preached in the Catholic church, Jehovah Witness. I'll preach, if they'll call me for revival, I'll preach in all of them. I'll let them have it. They may run me out, but I'll go, amen. I'll take, and I'd go into these free will Baptists and general Baptists and Pentecostals and Nazarenes, and I'd get up and I'd say, how many of you seen in the last three days? <laughs> They would raise their hand because they know I'd have them lost again. Amen. They'd have to get resaved that night. But I got to read my Bible, you know, and, and I, I got to read uh, that these things have, uh, this is the record that God has given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. And I got to read in the Bible, and I said, boy, Lord, you said whosoever is born of God. Now, this is after I got saved, and I'm already preaching. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth any man who cannot sin, for he is born of God. And I said, Lord, Lord, I, I just sure I got saved that night. And I said, Lord, I know I got saved, but Lord, I've sinned since I got saved. You see, if you're not careful, you're redefining sin. You know what I had to do tonight before I preached? Now, I'll tell you what, God, he, he has a sense of humor. This afternoon about 3 o'clock, I got cranky with my wife. When you, hey, you men, how many of you men can't hear and it aggravates you because you can't hear your wife? Raise your hand. I just want to know I'm not the only guy in the world does that. And so my wife, she's real soft-spoken, and I couldn't hear, and I couldn't hear, and I was really wanting to hear, and I said, honey, I can't hear you. And I got cranky with her. It's worse than that. I'm not going to tell you how it was. Anyway, it wasn't all that bad. But it was bad enough. The Lord said to me before I started preaching tonight, you don't go make that right with your wife. You're preaching on your own. I said, Lord, I don't want to preach on my own. Amen. And I had to walk over and put my arm around my wife and say, honey, I want to ask you to forgive me for being cranky with you. You see, I didn't used to think stuff like that was sin. And you women being smart aleck to your husband, you think you're spiritual and you're telling him all the time and you run him around manipulating him like a Jezebel. Then you're going to get up and do your deal at church. God ain't in that. And I'll tell you, that's why you ain't blessed and that's why you've had to have fake blessings for 45 years. Now I'm preaching. The amen has stopped. The confused sign. The Bible, listen to this. The Bible said, anyway, I was on my desk and I laid my head down and said, God, I've got to know the truth and I'm not going to a commentary. I'm not calling some preacher. I want to know about salvation. Your word says that if, if, if who served born of God doth not commit sin because the seed remaining many cannot sin. I said, Lord, I know I've sinned. And all of a sudden, now here's the deal. Because I had been reading the Bible a lot, all of a sudden it started hitting me and it started coming to my mind. And I said, Lord, show me. Lord, you've got to show me. I'm not letting somebody convince me of their denominational line. Right. And the Holy Ghost of God says, new man, old man. Amen. Flesh, spirit, Amen. raven, dove, yeah. Jacob, Esau. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost just flooded my heart. And it, you, you, you may be raised in knowing the truth, but I didn't know it. You can't imagine the power and the joy and the love that swept over my soul whenever God whispered to me, Reggie, don't call me a liar. I gave you eternal life. The old man does nothing but sin. The new man does He cannot sin. The new man is created in true righteousness and true holiness. The new man has divine nature in him. Reggie, I didn't try to. It's not an old, it's not a new suit on the old man. It's a new man in the old suit. And I'm telling you something. Hey, there was an anointing. There was an unction. But what bothers me is this. you got people who say, well, I'll read the Bible. I actually can't understand nothing. You won't, lest the Holy Ghost. And sometimes you're going to have to beg God. 
Now listen, the Bible said, verse 27, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. Now listen to this. And ye need not that any man teach you. You know what that means? Teaching's wonderful. There's a gift of it. But you could get it on your own if you wanted it bad enough. But no, we want to sit like little fish guppies. Most of us believe what we believe because somebody else told us. Not because we read it in the Bible. Not because we studied it out. And I'm going to give you a little something tonight. You know why your kids ain't in church? You know why your kids aren't following your faith? Because you, they have a faith that's not founded on your personal knowledge and your walk with God, and you cannot pass a faith on that you carried and you pigeon carried from some preacher. Amen. They see it, they sense it, and they know it. The confused sign. There is a spiritual book. It is written by the Holy Ghost. And when you have the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Ghost of God, if you're a saved man, will reveal this book to you. You may have to plead with God. You may have to beg God. But I'm going to tell you, yes, there's deep things of God. There's a lot of more. The more I read the Bible, the less I know. And the more I go, the more I find out I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something. There's such sweetness in this book. And when the Holy Spirit of God lifts something off the page to you, I'm asking you tonight, are you have a confused sign? Or you have a carnal sign? Do you have that craving sign? Do you have that confused sign? Now, the, the next one I want to preach tonight is the coming sign. The coming sign. Are you afraid of the coming of Jesus Christ? Are you afraid of the coming of Jesus Christ? Let me tell you, a lost man does not look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ coming. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is. I'm going to tell you something, brother. The older you get, the farther you go with Jesus Christ, the more you look forward to his coming. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But if you're sitting here tonight and the coming of Jesus Christ is not exactly what you'd like to happen tonight, I'm telling you something. The Bible teaches that when the Spirit of God, there is something about you like that song that was sung, you're going to want to go home with the Lord. You're going to, going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said in 1 John 2, 28, Now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, that we may have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 4, 8, a crown of righteousness, all them that love his appearing. I want to ask you tonight, are you looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? The next sign is the continuous sign. Now hang on to your hat. I said a while ago and I mentioned this. The Bible said in 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they no doubt would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not all of us. The Bible said in John 8, 31, listen to me well. I said a while ago, some of you are hanging on to the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And you're hanging on to that for dear life. And you know you're not right with God. You know you're not saved. You know the Spirit of God does not witness in you. Listen what the Bible said. John 8, 31. If ye continue in my word, that's just as much Bible as John 10, 27 through 30. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. The Bible said in Romans 6, 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Let me tell you something. I grew up, and, and again, I, you need to understand my background. But there was a lady in our town who went to the First Baptist Church, and she popped off one day and said, I'll tell you something right now. If I'm sitting down in the beer joints drinking a beer and Jesus comes, I'm out of here. She told that to a bunch of lost people. If that's what you think not, you got something bad wrong inside you. Amen. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ will never leave you nor forsake you. But I'm going to tell you, if you've got an attitude that you can go around slutting around, fornicating, adultery, pornography, living like hell, and you're, all you're hanging on is once in grace, always in grace, something wrong, buddy. That is not scripture. And I'm going to tell you something further tonight. The Bible teaches in the parable of the sower there were people who received the word with joy. Woo! Man, they got up from the altar and they're so happy, happy, happy. But they didn't have no root in them. And after a while, tribulation and things came and out of here. 
You listen to me tonight. Not everybody that makes a profession gets saved. The doctrine of perseverance is in the Bible whether you like it or not. And it's not you persevering. It's him persevering through you. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. You better get it down. I, I don't know why. I've never done this before. Where's the pastor? Is he out praying somewhere? I've never done this before the church service in my life. Have I ever said what I've said tonight? There's somebody hanging on to the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And you're hanging on that and you're going to fly into hell. Because there's no evidence that you've ever really been born again. You're just hanging on to that little deal. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this, that you claim to be saved, but you continue in sin. There's something wrong. You say, well, Christian sin, that's right. But I'm going to tell you something else. There'll be a grieving of the Holy Ghost within you, and there'll be a chastisement of God. And let me say next that there's a company sin. You have no desire to be with God's people at God's place. You're more comfortable and you enjoy the, the things of the world than you do with the saints of God. Yep. When it comes down to it at work, you're ashamed of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Did you know that Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and of my word, yes. that I'll be ashamed of you before the Father? Yes. I'm going to tell you why America's dying. Christian people quote Christian people walking into workplaces and they're shutting their mouth and they're thinking they're not supposed to say anything. Let me tell you something. If that's the case, then you do not live in a free land. First John 3, 14 says, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Amen. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. The Bible said, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Amen. I want to ask you tonight this. I didn't say that you got along with everybody, but do you love the brethren? Amen. If you don't love the brethren, God says, I didn't say, you're not saved. Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much the more as you see the day approaching. What about that company sign? Do you enjoy being around God's people? When a person has no desire to be at the house of God with the people of God worshiping God, that's a bad sign. There's also the calling sign. And by that I mean no answered prayer. 1 John 3, 22, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. One of the greatest reasons we're losing our young people in America is because they've never seen dad and mom pray and then they've never seen mom and dad really say there's answered prayer. Right. When's the last time you've been able to document in your journal or in your Bible, God heard and answered that prayer? I'm going to be honest with you tonight. God answers prayer. God answers prayer. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says later. Sometimes he says not now. And sometimes he says yes, Rich. The Bible said if ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more should your Heavenly Father give good things to them that ask him? My wife and I tonight can tell you a trail of 30-some years of answered prayer. I don't know. I just expect God to answer. He's my Heavenly Father. I'm telling you something. God is so good. God hears, God answers prayer. Yes. I want to know something tonight. Have you prayed? Do you have records of prayer where God has answered prayer, genuine prayer? What the world calls little prayers. What the world calls big prayers. Little things that nobody else, oh, listen, he said, when you pray, enter into your closet and thou shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret. Thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. I wouldn't know how many times I climbed into our closet and fell on my knees and got on my face and said, God, nobody else in the world has to know about this, but you do, Lord. And God, I'm asking you to do great and mighty things. 
I've seen God do miracles. Let me tell you something. The night I, the night I surrendered to preach, I nailed it in old-fashioned mourner's bits. And when I, when I gave in and I fought God 10 years, all I wanted to do was make money. And I'll tell you, that's, that's all I want to do, just make money and enjoy my life. But I tell you, I had watched preachers be scared to preach the truth. And I tell you, I can't stand a coward. And I said, God, you're going to have to put something in me and on me. If I preach, God, you've got to put something in me that I will have no fear of man in my, in my heart. And Lord, I don't want to just be a normal preacher. God, if you're God in heaven and you've called me to preach and the Bible's the word of God, Lord, I want you to use me. I want to see you do something. I want to see people saved. I want to see a work of God. And you know God has answered that prayer. I tell you something, God has, God has so answered prayer through the years. I could just tell you hundreds and hundreds of prayers that God has answered. Just, I mean, just today we talked to our daughter. We got a house. We needed soul. We prayed. She just told me to see and said, Daddy, it passed the appraisal and the inspection, and we'll probably close it next week. I just said, Lord, thank you for hearing that prayer. I'm just saying, take everything. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I'm talking about praying tonight. Amen. I'm talking about raising your family where they know that God answers prayer. There's another sign tonight, and that's the confirming sign. Now I want you to listen very carefully because this verse scares me in the Bible. In 1 John 3, 24, it says this, and hereby I know we, hereby know that he, ab we, that he abides in us and we abide in him by the spirit which he hath given us. The old timers, John Wesley was traveling on a boat from England. They got into a storm and John Wesley got scared for his life. This is his own testimony. There was a group of Moravian missionaries. By the way, Georgia was involved in that trip. It's one of the reasons Georgia's had the gospel like it's had down through the years. Study your history. John Wesley noticed that those Moravian saints had no fear of death. They were calm during the storm. John Wesley went to them and said, how can you be so calm in a storm like this? And they said, we have the witness of the spirit with our spirit. And they asked John Wesley, now listen to me, John Wesley had been preaching and even been doing work as a missionary and was not saved. They, said, he, they asked John Wesley this question, I'm going to ask you this question tonight. Do you have the witness of the Spirit with your spirit? Does his spirit witness with your spirit that you're a child of God? The Bible said, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. Romans 8, 16 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I want to tell you something tonight, what we've got problems with. I'm all for giving people biblical assurance. And I know we're not saved by feelings, but I want to tell you something. When God saves a man, the Holy Ghost of God will bear witness to that person that you're saved. And if 14 devils lined up in front of the church and said, you're not saved, you couldn't talk that man out of it because the Spirit of God witness to that man's spirit that he is a child of God. And that's what we're missing. We're wanting converts so bad. We're wanting to be able to report baptism so bad that we'll say what we know we can get to get the head to nod and say everything right. Instead of waiting on the Holy Ghost of God to bear witness with that man's heart that he is a child of God. I don't know any of you from Adam's house, cat tonight. I don't have an agenda. I'm not mad at you. I'm not after anybody. But I am telling you tonight, the Holy Ghost of God is after somebody here tonight. The Spirit of God is not bearing witness. Down in your heart, you stood over the kitchen sink and said, something's wrong. You drove to work in the morning and you said, something's wrong. You got out of your car and you said, something's wrong. And tonight, the Holy Ghost of God is telling you by the word of God, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I'm talking about being born of the spirit of God. And then there's the creation sign. There's no new man. Second Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. Gone is all my debt of sin. A great change has been wrought within. And now I begin to live. The Bible teaches if you're saved, there's a new 
creature in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, when the old time gospel was preached in this country, drunks would get saved and quit drinking. I'm telling you something right still today, when a drug head gets saved, God can break that drug addiction to him. I'm going to tell you something. God is a God that takes away our sin and saves us from our sin. God is not a God who says, hey, you don't have to go to hell. You're going to heaven. Go live like you want. Amen. That is not God. Amen. That is not God. I'm saying the Bible said this, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. It still says that. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you remember when you repented? Do you remember a work of the Holy Ghost working in your heart? The Bible said the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance. I do not believe in salvation without repentance. Except the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I'm asking you tonight, did you ever repent or did you just repeat a prayer? Amen. Did you ever repent? Was there ever a work of the Holy Ghost of God that convicted you of your guilt of, sin, of sinning against God, transgressing against the Holy God, and brought you to repentance to where you were willing to say, God, have mercy upon me and save me. I'm saying this tonight. Listen, I preach this in love and the fear of the Lord. Matthew chapter 13, there's one other sign I want to give you, and that's the chastisement sign. The Bible said that if you're sons of God, you're going to be chastised. Amen. If you be without chastisements, listen to the Bible. You're bastards. Amen. And there's a lot of spiritual bastards in this country. I'm going to say something while I'm up here. We've changed every Bible word there is that we can for our culture. And we don't use the word bastard anymore except to cuss somebody. But the Bible says, that you know what a bastard is? It's a child born out of wedlock. And our forefathers kept that term not because they wanted to hurt somebody's feelings, because they wanted to protect our marriages and our family and protect the integrity and the righteousness of our nation. Amen. Not to put somebody down or tear somebody up. And by the way, they received and they raised and they welcomed and they you know, did what they could and so forth. But nowadays it seems like it means nothing. I'll tell you, as far as I'm concerned, it's pretty dead gum low to conceive children and bring them into this world and not give them a daddy and a father. I would preach a revival in downtown Indianapolis, Indiana with a black preacher by the name of Reuben Fields. He was born, he, born in Louisiana. His father was sold as a slave in, in Sedalia, Missouri, the state I live in. And when they sold his father and mother out, out of the state of Missouri just before the Civil War, Reuben told me, he said, Reggie, the, my, it was passed on down to my, by my grandmother. That my grandfather, who was in, and he was 87 years old when he told me this. He said, when they sold my da granddaddy and Sedalia at the auction block, and they sold my mom and all the kids, they went to two different plantations. And he said, the, the man that owned them came up to my came up to the man that bought my dad, my grandpa, and said, listen, you better buy that family or he'll never stay. He'll be fine if you keep that family together. And the guy said he wouldn't do it. Reuben said, my grandpa cut a fit in the middle of that slave auction and said, I'll not go without my family. And Reuben said, Reggie, that man saw he was going to have trouble. He went over to the man that bought his wife and children and said, I want to keep the whole family together. And he said he put the whole family together and took them all down to Louisiana. And that's where they were when the Civil War got over. And Reuben Fields told me this. He's driving me through the black area downtown Indianapolis. People sitting on porches, young people walking up and down the street, not doing nothing. He said, Reggie, welfare has killed our, our race. 80% of the people on these sidewalks do not know who their dad is. He said, all these boys going around, all they think about is drugs and sports. And he said, they think it's cool to father a bunch of kids. And the girls think they can get more money the more kids they get. And he said, what burns me up? They call me an Uncle Tom up here. But he said, my grandpa wouldn't let me sold at a slave auction in order to keep his family together. Come on, bro. And he said, nowadays, the black fathers don't even want to claim their own children. And may I say to you, that is the white, 
fatties too in this country. Right. I don't tell you something. I'm just telling you about a story there. But it makes me sick. You got a bunch of boys running around. I'll tell you what, laying in bed with everybody they can lay in, and you don't want to claim that child. You want them to abort that child. God have mercy. I will tell something else to you little church mommies. You was all right. We was against abortion until it was your daughter, weren't you? Yeah. No, you didn't want to walk in there. I, I remember a story about a little sister Wigglejaw. Girl came into church and she's pregnant, not married. Says, what comes up to the pastor? She'd be coming three or four services. Girl's pregnant. What are we going to do about that girl's pregnant? What are you going to do about that girl's pregnant? Won't you do something about that girl pregnant? He said, listen, we're working with her. We're working with her. Don't worry about it. Why did baby something done? I didn't have that girl in here, but that, that, that baby, she laying around like that little whore. So the pastor started trying to do something about it, and of course the thing he found out, the sister Wigglejaw's grandson was the father. You better be careful how condemning you are on people that's in sin. Yes, It'll wind up being you. I'm saying tonight, listen, the chastisement sign but my heart, I won't be honest with you tonight, I'm, I'm having a hard time preaching. I'm, I'm thankful for all the churches down here in Georgia. Please keep your churches open. Keep, please keep preaching. Keep answering the call to preach. Keep having revivals. Keep doing everything you can. America's depending on the churches. It's on the hope we got God's people, I'm telling you. I'm not up here to be mean to you tonight. But I'm telling you something, if we don't have revival that affects the real way we live, we're going down. There is no hope. Chastisement. If you be without chastisement, we're of all our partakers. Let me tell you what God will do. God will scourge you. Now, if you say, Reggie, I've sinned, and I tell you what, you don't, I don't get whipped. You're not saved. If you are saved... God will chastise you when you get out of his will. I promise you, that is the Bible. And if you're without chastisement, you say, I can sin and get by with it. You ain't saved. That's just period. You're not saved. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? The Bible said in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24, Jesus gave the parable of the tares and the wheat. Now, I'm not an expert on wheat nor tares. But what I've read and understand is that tares to the untrained eye look almost exactly like wheat, especially at certain stages. And the disciples asked him, he said, should we go in and tear the tares up and so forth? Jesus said, no, you just wait to the harvest. He said, the angels will separate the tares from the wheat. Amen. Now God said there'd be tares among the wheat. And I've been, I've been through a lot of battles and I'm, I'm not griping, grand, going nothing about, I've been through a lot. And my wife, I've got a godly wife. And there's some, I've been preaching here a while ago. It's like the Lord said, cool down, sweeten up. I love these people. Don't be too hard on them. I'm not here to hurt you tonight. I'm not here, Paul said, for your destruction. Amen. What I am preaching tonight with everything within me, I just feel so burdened that there's some people here tonight that's, you know, it's not that you're, you mean to be lost, maybe. It's not that you intentionally mean to go to hell or something. But you're deceived. Yep. You've never really been born again. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's older people. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'd hate to think that I stood on judgment day and somebody in this crowd said, you know, you was down in Georgia preaching revival meeting. You just got up there and dilly-dallyed around. And I was, I was a professing Christian and I was lost. So why didn't you preach what God put on your heart? Why didn't you tell the truth that night? Yeah, come on, brother. Let's see more. Now we're going to do something. The Bible says the light, the eye is the light of the body. You ever heard your mama say, look me in the eye and say that? In just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to turn to somebody that's sitting beside you. And I'm going to tell you before we get there what I'm going to ask you to say. I'm going to ask you to look them straight in the eye with no smirks and no smiles and no laughing. And I'm going to ask you to look that person in the eye and say, I'm going to, you could repeat it after me, that I am a wheat and not a tear. And I'm going to tell you a little something tonight. 
your eye will tell on you. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm not doing it to be mean, and I'm going to tell you something right now. I, I told God a long time ago, ain't nobody gets saved, nobody does nothing. I'm just, I'm just a mailman. I'm bringing a message. I unload it. I go home. What you do with this between you and the Lord. But I'm going to tell you what I wouldn't do tonight. I wouldn't leave this meeting without making sure that I saved I'm telling you, man, I would not mess around about it because there is a hell underneath your feet. And there are people screaming down there in hell tonight that would give anything in this world to set where you're setting. Anything in this world to set where you're setting. So right now, I want you to look at somebody right next to you straight in the eye, and I don't want no laughing, no smiling, and I'm not joking. And if you're afraid to do it, you may have real trouble. I'm asking you to do that. Look them right in the eye and, and repeat after me. Look them right in the eye. Are you ready? Say this, I am a wheat and I'm not a tear. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, I know Lord tonight that only you and I'm glad only you can search the heart. But Lord, I pray tonight you do the same thing you did for me on that night, Heavenly Father, when you convicted me of my hypocrisy and my deceit and my foolery and and my phoniness, Lord, and, and Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that you showed me some road signs on the road to hell. And Lord, tonight, I don't know whether it's what sign that may have come up before the heart, the eye of the heart of some people here tonight. But God, I'm praying tonight that you'll reach down with love and tenderness. And God, that you'll put your finger, that Holy Ghost finger on somebody's heart tonight and say, that preacher's preaching about you tonight. I sent him here for you. And I pray, God, tonight that they would forget about what everybody else thinks, forget about what anybody else says, and they'd make sure that they're saved tonight and they would call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for mercy and forgiveness of their sin. And Lord, I pray tonight that the Holy Ghost of God will bear witness in this service. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed tonight. And I want to tell you a little something that God put on my heart to say. The older you are, and the farther you've went down this religious road, the harder it will be for you to get honest and get saved tonight. Don't you let anything or anybody, especially your pride, keep you from getting saved tonight. There, God says, examine yourself. There are road signs in the Bible on the road to hell. God clearly posted them for you tonight, and now it's up to you to respond to God. I want to ask us just in a moment to stand. And when I ask you to stand, I'm going to ask you to come out of those seats and I'm going to ask you just to find a place to pray and kneel before God and do business with God. And I'm just begging you in Jesus' name, please be obedient to the Spirit and the Word of God. Let's stand together. Pastor Richard. Listen, if the Holy Ghost of God is speaking to your heart, obey him instantly. Do not wait at all. For the longer you linger, the harder it'll be for the Holy Ghost of God to persuade you to come to God. The Bible says the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. You come on tonight while they sing. Let's sing and you come.
before the Lord, and if you're saved, I want you to pray for the Holy Spirit of God to have victory in people's lives tonight. But as our heads are bowed just in reverence before God and in respect and just trying to do our best to lead you to Christ, I'm going to leave this pulpit in just a second or two, but I want to know something. Is there anybody to say, and, and I want to tell you, I'm not going to come back and aggravate you. If God don't save you and the Holy Spirit doesn't lead you, I, I'm not going to bug you. But I want to ask you, is there anybody here to say, preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved and the Holy Spirit has dealt with me tonight, but I, I, there's a battle going on in my heart and, and, and I don't know how to explain it, but I would just appreciate you before you go to sleep tonight, preacher, would you remember me in prayer? Would you slip your hand up just quick back there? Yes, I see that hand. God bless you. Is there some other tonight? Pray for me. I, I, I don't know for sure that I'm saved and I want to be, I just appreciate somebody praying for me. Maybe a little confusion. I don't know. You and the Lord's going to have to work that out. Is there anybody else? Say, preacher, pray for me. Just lift your hand up where I can see it and back down. And I'll be sure. God bless you there and there. God bless you. God bless you there. Amen. Let me tell you, and I'm going to promise, I'm, God knows your hand and your name and your heartbeat, and I'm going to pray for you tonight. Back home, I have a man in our church named Charles. Charles is 90-some years old. And um, my brother led Charles to the Lord at his house. And Charles was probably 85 years old when he got saved. I never will forget baptizing him down there in the creek. And he stumbled into that water. Charles is dying. He's got three kinds of cancer. And it'd be a wonder if he's still alive, but when I get home, I tell you, I'm mighty glad that he wasn't so proud at 85 years of age. Got down on his knees and said, God, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. God saved me. You know, uh, you may be here tonight. You might be 70. You might be 80. You might be 90 years old. But God saves 90-year-old people. It's just the same as he does. That's it, the pastor. You just, it's, I, I, it, that's fine with me, ma'am. Come right ahead if you want to. Come right around there if you'd like to. But uh, I just want you to be saved. Lord, tonight, uh, these folks raised their hand. I want to pray for them now. I pray, God, that you'll make it real clear to them, Lord. I pray the sweet, sweet spirit of God would just come down on their soul. And, Lord, they would just come before you, Lord. And, God, maybe just say, Lord, if I ain't saved, just show me. And, Lord, if I'm not, I'm asking you to save me now. I pray, Lord, just lead them to yourself. But, Lord, I tell you, folks need to know where they're headed in heaven or hell, God, and I don't want folks wondering, and I pray, God, I thank you tonight, Lord, that you solved that thing with me and cleared that water up with me. I thank you for your word, Heavenly Father, that gives us assurance. But I lift these souls up before you tonight, that, Lord, before they, Lord, go to sleep tonight, they'll get this thing settled, and the peace of God will be theirs, and they'll know where they're headed, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.